afternoon, everyone. Welcome um, to our conversation with strategy featuring Ilana Betel on strategy and the private sector. Uh, my name is Eleonora Natale. I'm a lecturer in international history at the Department of War Studies. Um, conversation with strategy, as you know, is a monthly appointment that we have here in the department uh, to offer the opportunity uh, to students um, to meet our most prestigious uh, visiting fellows and ask them questions about uh, their research, their area of expertise and their uh, career. So uh, we have, as you know, a number of former diplomats and intelligence analysts among our uh, visiting fellows, journalists, civil servants and policymakers. So um, in this conversation, they usually discuss their career journey uh, and they provide tips or advice uh, for students uh, for success in their chosen uh, profession and also offer insights uh, into contemporary strategic challenges. So uh, before I introduce our guest today, um, I remind you that the discussion will be followed by um, questions and conversation with students. So please use the Q&A box uh, here on Zoom to leave your questions and I will collect them at the end of the conversation. Um, and also this event is going to be uh, recorded, so we'll available on the World Studies uh, website. So today we have here uh, my colleagues, Professor uh, James Gao and our special guest and visiting fellow Ilana Betel. Uh, James is Professor in International Peace and Security here at World Studies. He was responsible for a number of projects on security and diplomacy in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, among other things, he has served as an expert advisor and expert witness for the Office of the Prosecutor at the UN International Criminal uh, Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And um, he was also an expert advisor to the UK Secretary uh, of State for Defense. His research interests include um, international peace and security, um, war crimes, UK and European security policy, and the Yugoslav uh, war. Ilana Betel, thank you for being uh, with us today. Um, she's a, a strategic advisor, writer, and historian. She's a former UN uh, official and advisor for the Balkans, and she has worked extensively um, with both governments and clients in the private sector on geostrategic and policy um, issues related to security, defense, and energy in the European Union, in Russia, Turkey, and the Middle East, and the transatlantic community. Uh, she has a background in media and uh, academia. She has published widely, including a weekly column on the EU defense and security. She holds a PhD in history from UCL. Uh, she's a member of the Women in International Security Senior Advisory Board in Brussels. So thank you both for being with us today and I'll leave you the floor for conversation. Thank you, thank you very much, Eleonora. Uh, and Ilana, hello again, welcome. Uh, uh, I, I should say that I've known Ilana for quite a long time uh, in, in, in meeting around her husband because she and I were perhaps the only ones who really understood what a transformative role he played, but that's a story for another day. But it does mean that she's it, she, she, she is well placed to understand strategy. And, I th and we'll come to that a little bit later. I was thinking, Ilana, maybe first of all, uh, you could just give us a little bit of background on how you, you, you went from doing a PhD on civil military relations, I would call it, that kind of thing at UCL, uh, to working with the UN in that system, and then from that into the world of that magical word consultancy, where who knows what it really means, but lots of people seem to do it and do very well with it. Well, first of all, thank you very much, James. I'd like to think I know slightly more about strategy than just um, sleeping with a general, but there you go. Um, <laughs> um, far more seriously, um, my PhD wasn't necessarily in civil military relations. My PhD was in conscripts and conscription in the First World War. And the relevance of that was much more to do with both what their experiences were which you could call civil military relations, but maybe more significantly as to their memory and why nobody knows that approximately over half of the 5 million men who became um, soldiers in the First World War in the UK uh, were conscripts. Everybody thinks that most of them were volunteers. So I became very interested in the way um, uh, societies and countries understand war 
deal with war, um, have war as an imagery. Um, when I finished my PhD, I did a postdoc at Tel Aviv University and um, carried on within that field, dealing mostly gender, actually. I dealt in masculinity um, and a variety of other things, but had to admit that I found it not entirely fulfilling, if you want to put it that way, and had an opportunity to go and attend um, the UN General Assembly um, as part of the third committee, which is the Human Rights um, Committee, and um, to be in the women's debate, because there's human rights and there's women's rights, it's not the same thing. And um, just realized I'd found my metier and really, really loved it. Um, and this was in 1993, and then again in 1994. Um, and at that time, Bosnia was all over the headlines everywhere. It was, this is the biggest hotspot in the world. But in fact, they were having a huge problem getting people to go there. And uh, a call was put out to uh, delegations in the UN as to whether they could help find people. And I was asked whether I'd be interested and I immediately said yes. And went on a two month contract and stayed there for two and a half years initially in Sarajevo. I arrived there in very late 1994 and left in the middle of the spring of 1997 and uh, found it absolutely fascinating. And again, just realized I'd found my metier, if you want to put it that way, of putting into practice um, a lot of um, the more theoretical ideas I'd had to deal with as an academic and actually dealing with the day-to-day -day of what a war situation is like and conflict and its conflict resolution problems or lack of conflict resolution, as we know in the former Yugoslavia and especially in Bosnia. Um, I just found it fascinating and it went from there. I stayed with the UN on and off. I say on and off because I actually left after two and a half years. I was rather exhausted and took leave of absence and was a fellow at Oxford at um, Green College, which at that time hosted the Reuter Foundation. And I uh, wrote a paper on um, the media and Bosnia. Um, which was the very first manifestation of the problems between reporting and the way media represents conflict, which I think has just got worse and worse over the past 25 years. And uh, then went back to the UN and carried on in my uh, merry way with regards to the Balkans, um, including the Kosovo War and um, became the senior advisor on the Balkans in the Department of, then the Department of Political Affairs. It's now joint uh, with the Department of Peacekeeping Affairs um, and entirely by chance um, again was not sure what I wanted to to do um, in terms of UN jobs that I was being offered um, came here to do a took a leave of absence came here to do a short consultancy to see what the private sector was like and that was 23 years ago this month and, and the rest is history <laughs> and, and, and here is Brussels and here is Brussels indeed yeah <laughs> Can tell us a little about the consultant's life in Brussels, the different people with whom you've worked, the different companies and the relationships with government organisations? I should start out by saying two things. One of them was the reason consultancy became even remotely interesting to me, apart from as a source of income, was that the UN had no offices properly in um, Brussels at that time and still doesn't have a very strong representation. The, um, the main European headquarters of the United Nations as the United Nations Secretariat is in Geneva. Um, so even though they end up opening all kinds of um, ad hoc offices here when there's a need, um, it's a huge waste of the taxpayers' money, if you ask me, given that both NATO and the EU, which are very relevant to the UN, especially with regards to peacekeeping and a variety of other issues, are in Brussels, but for historic reasons, it stays there. And definitely in 1999, it stayed there. And uh, so when I decided to stay here, I had to leave um, the UN effectively. And um, at that time equally, so this was in 1990, no, this was in 2000 and then 2001, um, because of enlargement, the EU enlargement, the end of the Soviet Union, then the EU was undergoing a lot of transformations. And I suspect if I'd have come two or three years before, I wouldn't have been at all interested because it was entirely a regulatory town. But what had happened at that point was partly as a result of the Balkan Wars, partly as a result of the Maastricht Treaty, partly as a result of enlargement, it had begun to deal in a lot of other areas. And what we now know is the CFSP had started to grow 
um, rather largely. So suddenly there was a whole niche there for people who understood about things like defense and security, which really wouldn't have been the case before. The other thing about Brussels, which is really important to understand before I explain what consultancy does, is that it's not a typical consultancy city. Um, Brussels and Washington DC are, I came to understand, considered beltway cities. In other words, everybody in the city in one way or another deals with the business of the city, which is government legislation or whatever. The major difference is that because um, of the way the EU is structured and the importance of capitals, um, there are a relatively few think tanks here on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, more and more uh, policy issues are decided here collectively in one way or another, but companies often, even governments, don't want to pay for too big a representation. So you actually get to advise on core policy issues here, as opposed to what happens in a lot of other places, which it's largely lobbying in one permutation or another. Um, so when I first, you know, sort of started to do these things, as I say, it was the beginning of the CFSP, and a lot of um, aerospace and defense companies genuinely wanted to understand what was going on, um, how this was evolving, how this was being related to the Horizon program, which still exists each, every seven years, there's a new Horizon program, which is for um, research and development. And so it was very interesting in very many ways because I was just genuinely telling people what was going on, finding out myself and um, you know, doing a lot of what I did before in terms of policy work, but just doing it for the private sector with the added bonus that nobody got killed at the end of it. And I didn't really care if they took my advice or not. So it was great and I got paid for it. So it was very, very good. Um, having been that flippant though, the work of consultancy remains, again, consultancy is such a broad church for want of a better thing, which is what a nice Jewish girl would say, um, but it is, it can include anything from at the one extreme lobbying and at the other extreme genuinely advising governments, companies, whoever is in need of it on how to interface um, sometimes if, you, if they're doing it on a short-term basis, in other words, they've got a crisis. That's what they tend to call crisis management and you charge extra for that one. If they're doing it on a long-term basis, you're a strategic advisor often. And I sit at that end of the spectrum, if you want to put it that way. I advise anything from, as I say, governments to um, senior executives in companies about what the long-term issues and developments are in their specific area of interest or on a specific issue and um, how it is that they should position themselves and what are the potential risks um, and how they can you know, deal with that in one way or another. And so maybe you can take us to a sense of what strategy is, and you've already made clear that's more than the business of generals, uh, is, is uh, what it is and how it relates to these different organizations with which you deal and indeed the organizations which have hosted you or employed you or however the right term for that would be. I think that the, the way I see strategy and the way I understand it <clears throat> is first of all it's not a plan. Whoever thinks strategy is a plan has got it entirely wrong. <clears throat> and steps um, and it's a plan, it's a very good thing to have. You know plan away, do, do do that, but that is not strategy. Strategy is more what they tend to call nowadays the vision thing, which I tend to call not so much the vision thing, but um, what is your overall aim? What are the, uh, um, the issues that you have to take into consideration in order to attain that aim? And then you can start asking people for plans and what are the potential steps within it. However, it only becomes a strategy when there is resistance. So as soon as you start pursuing your aim, you're going to ensure, you know, you're going to encounter in one way or another, for better or for worse, forms of resistance, forms of objection. In the battlefield, um, it would be, you know, <laughs> you've encountered the enemy and the enemy's got other ideas about what your aims are and will try to subvert them. In the, uh, the corporate world, or indeed in the business world, which are not necessarily the same thing. If you're an industry or in something like that, it's something else. Um, you will be uh, um, encountering exactly the same sort of things, whether it's your rivals, whether it's um, 
for some of them it can be government legislation, whether it's um, geography, if you're in the energy business, which is a nasty word to speak of in the days of COP26 and climate change, but I have advised um, energy companies quite a lot, not so much in um, how to get I don't know, gas out of the ground, or I'm not a technician, that doesn't interest me at all. Um, but uh, one of the biggest projects I worked on, which is an interesting one to use as an example here, is um, a gas pipeline um, that ran from a certain place in Central Asia to Europe. That is a project that uh, had already been going for five years before I encountered it, and I worked on it for 12 years. And my part of it, again, had zero to do with anything uh, um, about how to make a pipeline, how to get anything to do with that. And I can say right now it's not Nord Stream and I stopped working on it uh, um, uh, about seven years ago, but um, it went through a lot of countries. You had to develop a, 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 an understanding of what are the abilities of each of these countries, again, not in the technical sense, but in the political sense, the geopolitical sense, why they would collaborate with one another, why they wouldn't collaborate with one another. Um, and, you know, sort of constantly finding ways in which to make this possible. Or when a block came up, that country decided that even though six months ago it said it was going to be doing x and then it suddenly decided it's against its interest to do x or it's been offered another deal y resistance uh, you have to come up with ways of circumventing that ways of coming up with another but your aim is constantly to get a pipeline going from country x to country y that and to do it in a way that is both um, benevolent to all the countries that it goes to, benefits all the countries that it goes through and delivers the project such as it was that um, uh, is necessary to do. So it's a it's very wide spectrum of how you do these things, um, but you are the one who has to keep a cold head, I would say, in most cases a cool head, and say, okay, shit happened, so let's move on to the next thing and see how we can get it back to where it is and always expect more shit to happen. But, you know, because as I say, resistance means that it's actually going somewhere. If you weren't going anywhere, nobody would resist it. You said your work was more in the perspective of long-term strategic advice, mm -hmm. uh, but you mentioned crisis management. And I'm aware that last year, uh, you were certainly sharing ideas about crisis management and the crisis that confronted all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, would you maybe be able to tell us a bit about the differences as you see it between crisis management and the longer term strategic advice that you'd be giving? Because some of what you just said sounds like crisis management to me, frankly. Uh, and also uh, maybe a little bit about yeah, all, the, all of this understanding and its relation to the CV-19 crisis that's shaped all of us. Uh, um, yeah. Absolutely. And I don't think what I said before was crisis management. Crisis management is when something unexpected happens, when you don't have a long term strategic vision or you don't have uh, an aim that you're going towards and then an event happens and it becomes a crisis because it turns out that you haven't foreseen it in any way, shape or form. And it's not um, it's not resistance. It's an event and it's an event that has come out of um, in, in, outside of anything that has been understood or planned. Now, crises tend to come about for two reasons. One of them is because they're genuinely unexpected. A whole set of circumstances that no scenario planning, no, no nothing uh, um, could have said would happen. Or because you were warned that it could happen, you didn't prepare for it, it happened and you're in a crisis. I mean, between those two extremes, you can find endless permutations, but I tend to find that those are the two forms of crises um, that, that you can understand and, uh, or you can expect in as much as a crisis is unexpected. So um, COVID-19 is a crisis in both those perspectives. So in other words, there was lots of scenario planning that said that there would be some form or another um epidemic they, it wasn't thought of as a pandemic but it was thought of that there could be especially on the back of ebola and on the back of a variety of other um animal born and bird born diseases that had been happening especially in africa and especially in the saudi peninsula um in the last in the decade previous to when covid began um there were many assessments that said that that could happen 
But because it had not really affected the Western world, I don't think that anybody took it seriously. So it was therefore perceived as being out of nowhere. Um, and anyway, once it happened, it was out of nowhere because there was no preparation for it. So you've got, as I say, both, both extremes. It was made worse by the fact that in many countries, um, a lot of what had been explained as strategy turned out to be a really bad idea. So the strategy had been, <laughs> this is globalization, let's just outsource everything to the cheapest bidder. Um, and that included pharmaceutical companies in which governments were all sort of like, let the pharmaceutical company decide what it wants. Pharmaceutical companies had decided that most generic drugs or most drugs had become generic and therefore they were not profitable. And within that vaccines were the same. So uh, facilities to make vaccines, which are intensely complicated as it turned out, um, had been closed down across many countries, not just in, the, um, in Europe, but in North America, South America, in a lot of parts of the world. A lot of it had genuinely been outsourced to India, which had decided to become a champion of these things. Um, and pharmaceutical companies had um, focused far more on high-end drugs, um, which were much more profitable. So high-end drugs are the sort of special cancers as opposed to your day-to-day -day breast cancer and um, uh, sort of cancers that have relatively small audiences, but for which you can charge, if you find a drug for it, vast amounts of money. I'm giving that as an example because governments have not noticed that, oh, if there is a problem, then who's going to make the drugs for us because we will need them for the whole population. Um, and then it turned out that a lot of the source material for a lot of drugs is also now done nearly exclusively in India and China um, for things like ibuprofen and paracetamol. Um, they are um, there. And just giving these two examples of medicines before we even get into other things like, uh, you know, masks and kits and all of these sort of things, that what had appeared to be a strategic decision, let's go global, had suddenly become a very, we've seen a completely different perspective of, oh my God, this is incredibly short-sighted. Who's going to provide us with all these things that we need? So um, there was a crisis in every respect of it, if you want to put it that way. It was short-termism, hiding behind the idea of uh, strategy. Therefore, all the, um, in many countries, they found that the various, um, uh, um, I'm using the word here, where we keep things. <laughs> uh, but basically, they, exactly, there was a huge shortage. You know, everybody had flogged off basically things like, um, you know, sort of basic materials, uh, masks, um, anything that you would need for a, a medical emergency on a large scale had been sold off, closed down, emptied out, given away, donated to the developing world, you name it. So that was the crisis in the developed world. And in the developing world, the crisis was they didn't have it to start with. Um, so that is a crisis in every respect. And that's, um, we're climbing out of it now, but not entirely uh, because um, it takes a long time to shift um, thinking as well as ca capacities of production, of um, planning in one way or another. Um, so crisis, though, though I would say in defense of systems, one thing, which is that we've been living through this at a snail's pace. So it seems to us that the pandemic has been going on for ages and ages and ages and nothing was done for a very long time. But actually, if you look at it in realistic terms, uh, the turnaround time has been amazing. You know, as historians, we know that when they'll look back on this, they'll say it's just been absolutely amazing that things were taken over so quickly. No, it's been astonishing how quickly yeah. some things have happened, including the emergence of seven different vaccines. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, uh, whatever their particular merits. Uh, do you think that was that the, the the locus of strategy, if if we if I can say that, that, that saw us cope with this and deal quickly, uh, was more in the public sector or in the private sector? Public, public for sure. In every country, as far as I can see, um, it was ultimately public sector that. Uh, I mean, I'm not getting into dodgy contracts and all the rest of it. I'm talking no. about thinking. Um, okay, what are we going to do? And then at the end of the day, it was our amazing, incredible education systems that could bring together uh, um, amazing thinkers and uh, who knew how to reach out to the practitioners, 
who knew how to work together with the public sector people to bring together these solutions. And then they could turn to the private sector and say, we need this and this and this, we want this and this and this. We can interface with you that way. So maybe you could expand that a little bit in the differences between strategy in the public sector, broadly, whether governments or UN, however that might be, and strategy in the private sector. So I think you've indicated earlier already some sense of difference, and this perhaps draws that out even more. It does. It doesn't mean that the, the private sector, um, your camera's frozen, James. Um, you, the private sector um, has a very, um, has, has a double audience, if you want to put it that way. It has its, um, usually whoever buys or uses or comes or whatever, you know, their end user, the, uh, uh, the customer, the client, whatever. And it also has their shareholders. So um, you are constantly having to juggle those two and find a way of um, bringing them into some form of uh, uh, coherence is what I would say. Um, and they are not often in complete um, agreement because the shareholders just want their money. That's why somebody has invested money into a company. Um, whereas your client, customer, um, you know, whatever it is you want to call it, wants the product, wants the best product for the best possible price, wants it now, wants it in quantity, wants it in whichever way it is that you want to, um, to see it. Um, the public sector um, used to only have one customer, if you want to put it that way, or one focus, which is the, the government. A public sector is there to serve the government, and the government serves the people. I would say that the biggest evolutions that we've seen over the past few decades has been that the public sector is perceived to serve the people um, as well as the government. And there's often a big contradiction between the two because the government is full of politicians who want short term um, solutions, who want them now, who want them to make them look good, whereas uh, the public also want short term, want immediate solutions, but they want to know that they're proper and you can count on them and that, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there's a big difference between the two in one way or another, and you have to strategize differently in order to be able to serve them. But um, what I have found as somebody who's moved between the two sectors is that they're remarkably similar. At the end of the day, it's groups of professional people trying to deliver a product and um, in the private sector, I tend to feel that you, they, you can cover it up. You can cover up the problems much more easily than you can in the public sector in one way or another. I think we may have lost James. <laughs> you, you have me by a secondary means, if you can hear me. <laughs> ah, he's climbing back through the window. <laughs> but the, 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 the king's internet dropped me on the computer. Uh, and is refusing to reconnect. So you have me without without the, the, the view uh, via my iPad for a moment while we try and get the computer going again. Um, uh, so in inevitably I missed <laughs> part of, of the answer there, but I, 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 I was already preparing to ask you because the final little bit of a question. Could you tell us a little bit about working with Fleischmann and Teneo and these kinds of companies with which you've been associated recently and you know, what exactly do they do and how do you fit in and how does that relate to any of these these kind of issues the private sector approach and I and I wish I'd heard more about the differences between them because it would probably make more sense than I would have included some nuances. Um, Basically, what those companies do, um, they are both what's known as public affairs um, companies. Um, Fleischmann, I'm, ju I'm just going slightly bigger just so that people understand how these things work. Fleischmann Hillard is part of uh, what's known as the Omnicom Group, which is a very large um, global um, company which has this huge portfolio of um, advertising, public relations, public affairs, 
strategy. Nowadays, they have huge amounts of online companies that belong to them. Omnicom, um, to give, Omnicom is one of the competitors of WPP, which is better known in uh, the UK. Um, I think it's overall, it, it shares, you know, it, it, it has a turnover of billions. Um, so Fleischmann Hillard is one of its companies, not particularly one of its bigger companies either, um, that specializes in public affairs and public relations. Its office in Brussels um, is considered to be the largest Brussels, I think nowadays is the largest public affairs company. It has a turnover of some 15 million euros a year um, and actually specializes mostly in financial services. Um, I tend to work with those companies because they just provide me clients and I don't have to unlock the plans for myself. So it's really quite as easy as that uh, because they tend to already work with very big companies and, um, um, and governments. Um, but I also work independently, um, sometimes not so much with companies as with um, governments and NGOs and INGOs. Uh, I work quite a lot with the Open Society Foundation, for example, on a variety of projects. That have got less to do with that and more to do with um, geopolitical issues and other areas. Um, Taneo is much the same, it's a smaller group, it's a private group and I just moved over out of because after 16 years I thought it was time for a change, nothing particularly mm -hmm. uh, more or less than that really. Nothing strategic about it. No. <laughs> no. Uh, anyway, uh, Eleonora, uh, maybe I can return to you to manage questions because I'm, I'm not in a position to do that like yeah this. No, absolutely and also thank I think it's, um, it's time so thank you both for this very uh, engaging conversation um, please leave your question in the Q&A um, section don't use the chat um, and I will monitor uh, questions for um, Ilana we have about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. So feel free to send us your questions. Um, in the meanwhile, I have like a curiosity. What, what is your, what was your favorite project? The most exciting project that you ever worked on as an advisor? Do you have a favorite one? Um, yes, I really enjoyed the pipeline. The pipeline was great, great, great fun. Um, um, I also uh, worked on two different free trade agreements for countries, uh, which I really enjoyed also. Um, that was a very uh, gratifying. Um, it was two Latin American countries over two different times and it was, it was very, very good fun uh, and very interesting because it uh, took me out of my comfort zone slightly. Uh, but understanding their interests and their needs, which are very different, you know, from country to country when you come to do a free trade agreement. It very much depends on what your sectors are in your country, why you're interested in it. Um, and uh, trying to get it through um, various governments and getting it through the European Parliament and understanding the obstacles there was very, very interesting. I mm -hmm. found out a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was also wondering um, how much did it count the fact that you had a PhD and you had experience in academia when you started, you know, uh, to move in this other sector? Do you think uh, it was crucial, the fact that you had developed skills in research uh, in academia, or do you think that, you know, for students who might think of that uh, sector as a profession? Oh, I wouldn't do it to go into the private sector at all. There's no need whatsoever. Um, um, I think that there was an appreciation, but I think it was coupled with the fact that I'd been working in the UN for several years and had quite a senior position when I left, that um, I think on its own, a PhD didn't really count for much, really, um, unless it was, because it wasn't a technical one, it wasn't offering something in a very specific area. Um, so I think that, you know, if you're wishing to advise on um, areas of expertise that, you know, sort of climate or something like that, it's really quite important to understand what you're talking about, really, you know, sort of, um, 
um, even at, at, at the political level, you really do need to know what you're talking about. And the same goes for, I think, financial services, for example. You don't need a PhD, but you really do need to understand how it works. Mm. Can I ask, do you get examples of people coming in, kind of younger people? Because you get the impression that for the kind of work, kind of consultancy, strategic advice you're engaged with, it has to come a bit from experience. Uh, and by contrast, I see quite a number of young people, uh, graduates, go to work in financial institutions in risk analysis because there they can take the research skills uh, and apply them. And it doesn't matter whether you've got experience and seniority to some extent. But for the kind of things you're doing, it really is a product of that experience. Um, is it? Yes, except that it's exactly the same as those companies that you're talking about, um, or those areas that you're talking about. So um, I just do it at the, the senior end of it. Um, but there's a lot of research and a lot of sort of, I work with teams that in which a lot of more junior people do those things. Absolutely. Wow. Um, and often I need them to just go and find out a huge amount of things for me because I just have no idea sort of thing, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that uh, um, there's, uh, um, you know, sort of, uh, um, you, you have it at all levels. There's a huge amount of starter jobs in, in consultancy. Mm -hmm. It's a very good place to start. So uh, there's been, a couple of questions turned up. So let me try and, yeah. Uh, how would you re recommend to a business practitioner to increase their strategic thinking? Yeah, what would they have to do to, in understanding capabilities and so on in this kind of world we live in and everything moving really quickly? Yeah, what do they need? What do they need to hear? Um, they need to hear where their, um, where their more long-term position is going to be and why it's going to be affected by unfolding events, why what they're doing now either feeds into that or not. And um, I tend to find that that's one way of explaining these things that, you know, um, it's really terribly important to um, um, speak in terms that people understand. So just sort of going around talking about grand strategy when, you know, it's one thing if you are, um, let me start this differently. If you're talking to a CEO or somebody from a big corporation, um, you have one kind of conversation because they have the capacity within them to, not within them just personally, but the organization to put aside resources for creating the conditions for what they need ahead they can decide that they're going to allocate funds to go and uh, uh, buy completely new equipment or to enter a new country or create a new market or whatever, which will only come to fulfillment in three, five, 10 years, depending on what it is, but how it is that you can advise them that you, the way that you see um, this issue developing, that market developing, or where governments are going on legislation, or I don't know what, you know, depending on the issue. If it's a smaller organization, that's where you tend to have a lot of these problems because they don't have the capacity to lay off the resources to do that. They have to um, usually work with me in much um, more um, shorter term. Their long term is usually financial, but their, sh their ability to maneuver and change product or change capability in the short term is often much more limited because they have a more limited range of product or um, what it is that they're trying to do, the services they're trying to offer um, have been structured precisely for that market. So they don't usually have built into them that same resilience that can say, okay, now you can lay off that in order to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you, Ilana. Uh, okay, sorry. Wait, yeah. Sorry. There are uh, some more questions from uh, Mikhail. Um, he's asking, when and how did you realize that working on strategic advice was something you enjoyed and you were good at? Um, I really, really enjoyed it in the war zones. I really um, saw, because I found I was doing something that was contributing to a situation. And I mean, not to the bad situation, but to help solve the bad situation. Um, 
and also that you could be very creative and find niches that other people hadn't thought of, for example, um, and uh, try and find ways to do things that uh, were not necessarily run of the mill or issues that hadn't been thought of before. Um, and then translating that um, into the private sector, um, probably I found that when I was dealing simultaneously with NATO and the EU, I found it very satisfying. Yeah. So I, also it took me a few years to really understand the way both organizations worked and what their advantages and disadvantages were, and how it is that you can work with the best and get the best outcome from them. Thank you, Ilana. And Mikhail is also asking, he had three questions in one. So he's asking if you have any um, resources, any books or website that you would recommend to someone for improving their strategic capabilities. Um, no, <laughs> utility of force. That's a very good one. I'm thinking strategic. <laughs> I would say that since I wrote it, but no, I, I, I don't think I've ever really read um, um, what most affected me the way I was thinking. Very interesting. I loved Lloyd George's memoirs. I thought they were absolutely fascinating to understand how somebody who started out in one area and um, with a relatively narrow interest, political interest, uh, not only grew his own political vision, but really, really strategized how that was going to happen. And then when he became a wartime leader, understanding, grasping this huge, huge machine, which was the British government um, and a losing war effectively and how to turn it around. So I learned a huge amount from that. I think I found him very, very interesting. Not particularly nice man, but I thought he really, really thought in an interesting way. You've got to slot through three volumes. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> Could you expand on that just to give us the condensed precy of it all? Yes. Makes sense uh, of it. Um, um, it, it, Lloyd George, there's two things that he did, which, you know, he's often, to my mind, maligned because they, people only remember that he, you know, gave lordships or whatever, peerages to friends or whatever. But um, he was the one who got the 1911 Insurance Act through. He both wrote it and got it through. Um, and was willing, he really began to understand that the instruments of power in the state and in how to do it and how to work in a coalition. He put a huge amount of pressure on Asquith and on others in order to get this through. Um, and when he takes over, um, when he becomes prime minister during the war, when he takes over from Asquith, in his memoirs, he says, if he'd understood at the end what he understood then, that it, this was an economic war as much as it was a military war, he would have done things very differently. So I think a lot of his book is really illuminating in that, that he was willing to understand that things um, were beyond what you see in front of you or the immediate problem and to understand it as a much larger, intricate machine. And I think that I was very much, I, I would take that as being part of understanding strategy, which is that you've always got to understand things as being intricate and part of a machine as opposed to, this is the plan, this is where we're going, this is how we're going to get there. Oh, there's a change in the road, then we're going to get there that way and that way. Whereas he really understood how each issue, um, not necessarily interlinked, but had to be coherent with um, this ongoing event. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of reading about Abraham Lincoln and emancipation. Mm. Uh, I'd say there may be a similar comparative story, understanding, yeah. adapting, and, and getting the things through. Uh, do you think any of that is well understood, either by bureaucrats in Brussels or by the businesses that you've worked with and advised? Of course, it's partly understood once you've spoken to them, but I mean, do they have a real understanding of that? Or are they just kind of being a little bit, we want something now, short term, uh, even if it's looking to the long term, and we'll just listen to what Ilana says? Um, I think that it very much depends on who you would call. Uh, I feel prone to defend um, the bureaucrat, as you put it, the fonctionnaires, as they <laughs> 
um, he's, he, she, he are neither faceless as they're often depicted in the UK press. Um, they've got faces and they actually function. Uh, but actually, yes, they're very much part of a, uh, a very intricate, very complex uh, uh, machine, and they're very aware of that. They're also very aware that no matter what happens, and it's the same as in the UN. They say one of the reasons I have so much empathy for them is that um, having worked in the UN, you just know that you're always going to get blamed no matter what goes wrong. You know, it's as though that's what you're there for in one way or another. So, you know, sort of the Eurocrat is very much in the same, uh, um, you know, they can, again, they did do an excellent job both in dealing with the pandemic um, in the sense that they, health isn't even a common remit of, or a common competency as it's called here of the EU. Um, and in getting vaccines and in doing a hell of a lot of things and um, you know, just get blamed by the governments or by the, um, the population or the media in one way or another. But yes, I think they have a very, um, strong sense of working for a very complex machine that is made up of both um, institutions um, of which one of the institutions, the council is made up of governments. Um, so therefore is of a completely different makeup than most would have to deal with. And that your end user, um, who which is the people of the EU are quite far removed from you from that point of view, not because you're a faceless bureaucrat, but because um, they're citizens of states and the states are the ones who amalgamate together in order to, to do those things. A, B, practically by definition, everything the EU does is strategic because of its sheer size and for the fact that it doesn't run things day to day. It is there in order to be the backroom machine that gets everything going. So it's a constant issue of breaking things down into the smallest issue, building them up, seeing how it fits together as an intricate machine and then sending that out into some kind of process. Um, so those are, I think there is a very strong understanding from that. In the business community, the longer you're here, the more you understand that. Um, when you first come here, you think that it's sort of bafflingly complex and why do I have to put up with this? My company just wants that, or this sector just wants this. Mm -hmm. um, but um, once they've been here for a while, they do begin to understand there's a, there's a logic. They then get told they've gone native by their company or by their country, but that's something else internally. Uh, but yes, there is a sort of understanding that um, this isn't entirely just obtuse rulemaking in one way or another. That still doesn't take away from the fact that usually they're here for the profit and um, you know what's the quickest way to get to it in one way or another. I would say that one of the last things or, or one of the things I have learned over the years working in all of these machines, if you want to put it that way, not in them, but alongside them, is that in the best of all possible worlds, the best outcome is when you get business working with government or, or legislators or whatever it is you want to call it, with civil society. It's a magic triangle, I tend to call it, um, because then they all, in a rather strategic way, sort of they're each other's opponents, they're, they're the opposing force and they force each other to come to some kind of equitable um, solution. Um, and I most strongly understood this during the financial crisis in 2008 and then the Euro crisis, because um, usually what we call civil society is represented by NGO one way or another. And um, they have lots of experts in them and lots of, you know, I could have either gone into the private sector, I could have gone into the NGO sector, it would have been you know, equally interesting. Um, the problem with financial issues is that anybody who knows anything about them goes to work for them. So there's remarkably few uh, um, civil society organizations that deal in finance. And that was one of the huge, huge problems in dealing with the financial crisis, if you go back and look at it, which was it was straight off between business or the banks, if you want to put it that way, and governments and the EU. And therefore there was no mediating force and the banks largely got whatever they wanted because they convinced um, both the governments and the EU that unless you pay them, unless you give them the money, then they're going to collapse and then money is going to go broke. So they got the money and we paid. But the, it, it, it was quite an interesting example of where um, a strategic capacity failed because there was one part of the triangle missing. Well, talk of triangles brings Clausewitz to mind. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, I wonder if you'd care to, to, to take an invitation to develop 
thinking on Clausewitz and strategy in the private world. And I say this against a background, a, a prejudicial background, uh, that I've seen the books of Clausewitz for business uh, and uh, uh, a couple of colleagues, we kind of tried to attend some courses, which was quite difficult. They were very skeptical of, of people from King's and War Study <laughs> business courses purporting to teach things about Clausewitz. Yeah, and, and, and then they came up with the pre prejudicial view that they, A, didn't get Clausewitz anyway, and B, were more talking about planning, which is, of course, something that Clausewitz is not just exactly. talking about. Um, but the triangles, mention of triangles, does make me think of Clausewitz. So I don't think maybe you know, Clausewitz Clouds of it's for strategy in the private sector in two minutes. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would I would prefer my triangle to Clausewitz's one. I mean, you know, Clausewitz speaks of uh, you know the, tr the, the the Trinity, the Union, and I think mine is exactly the same actually. You oh, know that's why I was yeah yeah you know sort of unless you have um, both society public. Um, um, I call it civil society, but you know, it's basically us, uh, the consumer, the citizen, the, the paying person, paying everyone, which is the business, the bureaucrat, the bureaucrat, the civil servant, whatever, uh, on board, you will never get a good outcome if you just leave it to a straight off um, outcome between business and uh, uh, the legislator. So um, that is my holy trinity, absolutely. And he's absolutely right. Yes, I am Clausewitzian and I've just adapted it for you in one minute. But I would say that um, uh, he, after all, came to it because he participated in the Battle of Vienna, wasn't it? And mm. came away from it realizing this was a whole different way of war and went away trying to understand why it was that Napoleon could use his forces in the way in which he used them also end up with the forces that he had, given that, you know, sort of they were conscripts and they were a completely different force. Um, so I think we've unleashed a force in the world over the past um, 40 years for sure, um, or whether you want to call it since the end of the Cold War, I don't particularly mind whether it's since, mm. um, you know, Reagan, Thatcher, on the economic sense or whether it's since the end of the Cold War, but we have unleashed an idea that um, the private sector should never be reined in. And I don't believe in reining in the private sector. I believe that just uh, you have to have two elements together with the private sector and not just government or the regulator. And business likes to only talk about the regulator and why she or he are bad. Whereas I think that the bigger picture is also that we are there with a conscious thought as to what it was, is that we should want from our societies and from our businesses, which are integral to our societies. Hmm. That sounds uh, like a, a great point of conclusion. Uh, I'm aware we have a couple of minutes left, but also it would be a shame. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Want to go with that great summation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ilana and James, for this uh, great, fascinating conversation. Um, we don't have any more uh, questions for today, I think. So yeah, we can probably call it a day. So thank you again for being here today. And I will see you all next month for our next uh, conversation with strategy. Thank you so much, everyone, for Thank you. Thank you, Ilana. Thank you, Ilana. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.